Are you getting a rehair every other week when you're doing this? I mean, I, it's amazing. Like, like you know, <laughs> yeah, rehairing is part of the trick. The guys at the shop where I go, they say, you know, the only other people who come as frequently as you are, are the guys at the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> uh, I'm right up there with these guys who play, you know, these epic Wagner. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm the uh, the other one. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I really appreciate you tuning in. Visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what we're doing here. And I love hearing people's stories, and I'd love it if you reached out and told me your story. And you can do that by emailing me at feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. And I know you're going to love today's story about Pablo Aslan. Now, Pablo is the pioneer in the world of tango bass, and he's released groundbreaking albums like Piazzolla in Brooklyn and Tango Grill. And he's recorded and performed with artists like Paquito de Rivera, Yo-Yo Ma, and Daniel P.P. Piazzolla. And he's produced over a dozen albums for the Soundbrush label, including the 2007 Latin Grammy winner, Te Amo Tango. We get into how Pablo carved out his career playing tango bass in the mid 80s, and we dig deep into the techniques he uses, including the marcato style of playing and many other techniques. You'll hear excerpts throughout featuring Pablo's albums. And we've got links to these albums in the show notes. Plus, you got to check out his Avant Go Media YouTube channel. It's great, full of amazing playing. Now, you can learn more about everything Pablo's doing at his website, pabloeslan.com. He's a great guy, super friendly and welcoming. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with him. I trained as, as a uh, late starting classical musician. Okay. Moving up from uh, Argentina to California. In fact, I, I, I started out in Santa Cruz. Oh, um, nice. Near where you are. Yeah. Uh, my teacher was Mel Graves. Okay. Um, and Mel was kind of a disciple of Bert Turetsky. So I'm just sort of from, from the, you know, classical contemporary thing. Sure. Um, but, but late starter. So I really, when I was 18, I still couldn't quite play the instrument. Uh-huh. And so I, you know, I got off to a late start and, and but, but eventually started doing the, the symphony thing and uh, playing jazz and Latin jazz and so forth. And I discovered tango really when I moved to LA in the mid eighties oh, okay. and um, met a very few people who were involved doing that. And one of the things that really resonated with me was that it was a good gig. It seemed like the, the ideal place for a bass player, you know, you yeah. play rhythm section without a drummer and, and then you play with a bow. So it has all that classical stuff going on. And, and, and eventually when I started playing with better music, I, I ran into, you know, a small but significant group of uh, Argentine musicians, mo- mostly older people who were working. And so for a while I had a bunch of steady gigs, um, the years that I was there in LA and also discovered that there is, you know, a way to improvise, even within traditional tango. So that really attracted me. And then I, uh, by the time I was getting ready to leave LA, I was starting to do my first experiments with, uh, you know, sort of a jazz and tango fusion and having yeah. certain sections with somebody taking a solo and uh, the rest comping and that sort of stuff. It really gave me a, a place to hang my hat creatively and also um, a very unique way of making a living because I really, for a while, I was I was the only one doing this. Yeah. Um. At, at, you know, at a level where you know any any traditional tango player could call me and I would know all the songs and you know just sort of be part of you know being able to play the traditional stuff as well as when the piazzolla music started really taking off in this country. Also, um, I got a set of arrangements. You know, I'm talking about you know 30 years ago when it was so hard to find that stuff. I got a, I got a set of arrangements and formed a couple of bands to play Piazzolla's music. So the downside of all of this, you know, with somebody my age in Buenos Aires even would have had a hard time getting so much work playing tango um, at at the time because it really back in the 80s it was still kind of asleep. Yeah. The downside, of course, is that I didn't have any 
great musicians to look up to and see and watch and ask questions and, and that, all that good stuff. When 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 Piazzolla came through L.A. in the late 80s, I, I hung out with his bass player a couple of times. And then in Buenos Aires, I would try to seek out people who would show me. But um, I very much did, did this on my own and, and listened to an, an enormous amount of recordings and making sure that I knew all the songs and, you know, just kind of it, it gave me a, a big musical direction. Yeah. While I still did a lot of the symphony and the Latin jazz, and when I moved to New York, it was also a big source of work playing, but I was doing all kinds of other stuff, some avant-garde improvising and all, all sorts of stuff. Oh, cool. But it all, you know, it always just kind of gave me my my north, you know, yeah, my yeah, carrot. Yeah. Sure, right. <laughs> but technically, like, one thing that happened was that I had trained as a German bow player, and when I started playing tango for you know seriously in L.A., I realized I was never going to really get the sound unless I shifted to French bow. Oh yeah. So I did that on my own, and I've never really had formal lessons on the French bow. But I learned how to do that, and, and I you know I tried to copy the the stroke, and it took me a long time. And until recently, I felt I had not a clue, and now I finally feel like okay, I you know <laughs> I know what's going on. Yeah. So. That that in itself was a big learning curve, but I think what what it gave me is is the freedom to experiment and to make up stuff, even if for a while it was wrong, you know. Sure. And yeah. so I think I've I've developed a number of strokes and and ornaments and and hits and things that are you know that are my own. And yeah. so and also when I felt free enough to to really improvise, you know, to to make up bass lines and do all the stuff that jazz players do. At every moment, you know, mm -hmm. um, to feel strong enough with the bow, and you know, and loose enough and relaxed enough that I can that I can hold a band, even even a band of drums, you know, with the bow and be the bass player in the band, you know, without having to play written lines, but just making it up. That's when I really feel like it started taking off, and that's for me. If you if you look at my CDs, it's you know probably two or three CDs ago. And I have something called Tango Grill, which was a big improvising session down in Buenos Aires, even before that. But but since then, and also my my following record called PSO in Brooklyn, where I play with drums and it's really a lot more energetic stuff. And that we have recorded live. There's videos of that, and I feel like that's part of my path has been to sort of be a a bass player that has the strength of a jazz player, but but it's mostly bow centered, you know, and and uh, and with all the different rhythmic you know, variations that we do in tango, which are different sorts of syncopations and, and the marcato being a, a walking bass line, but not quite, you know, it's a different kind of beast and so forth. So, so that, that's, that's a little bit of what I've, what I'm about. You know, I still continue to do some Latin baits and a little bit of, I live in New York, so I can't be a jazz player in New York. There's right. <laughs> people right. who are at a whole other <laughs> level, you know? Sure. And so I, I, you know, I don't, I don't quite go there, but I, but I can, you know, I can play and some of the Latin stuff, of course, and classical. And I played a lot of klezmer, where you know this bowing stuff has come in very handy. In fact, I went back to German bow to play some Eastern European music because I felt like that oh. was better. Yeah. Um, so that's that, that's the sort of stuff that I that, that I do. Well, that's interesting that so you, so you start out a German bow player and then you, as you started getting into tango, you moved over to French and it's cool that you're still doing some some German too in different styles. What what yeah. what is it about the? I, I and I, I know it's the French bow is what was used in Argentina. That's why the style developed. But mm. what is it possible to play some of these techniques with German bow or is it really at a certain point you just got to play French bow? Uh, both. I mean, yeah. I've seen some very good bass players and some of them have come to me for lessons and stuff where they can get, you can start to approximate the stroke. It's, it works differently because you use the fingers differently in, 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 the, in, the, in the bows and, uh, you know, some of the specifics of how you throw your fingers around in French bow, you can't do with the German grip. Um, yeah. You just have to do it differently. I think eventually it's just, I don't know that you get the sound and the power, yeah. um, uh, but I would really, I would really have to spend a bunch of time with the German bow trying to do all the stuff. It's just not been worth it. Part of it has to do with where the balance point is and where 
where where the the power of the frog mm-hmm. uh, is, you know, um, with 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 the French bow, it seems like you're a lot closer to the frog, where you really have a lot of power. In German bow, what I've discovered is that you have to be a little more towards the middle of the bow to get that kind of stroke, and and because of the grip, um, that the power is a little more towards the center, like the real place where, you, you know, because in a way, the stroke that you're doing is almost like you're doing a pitch with the bow. Yeah, you know, it's really one. It's really one thing that you're doing. You're not really drawing the bow as much as you're doing. Boom, you know, it's like mm-hmm. one attack. You know, mm-hmm. and the rest, the sustain comes from the left hand, and so you really have to snap the string. And you, of course, you can do that with a German bow and so forth. But there's something about the mechanics of how the fingers extend and help you with that. And there's a little bit of a of a drag right before the attack. And, you know, there's, there's a number of specific things. And I, I really haven't seen anybody develop that on the, on the German boat. Yeah. Um, when you look at, you know, I was spending some time in, in Hungary a couple of years ago and watching, you know, playing some, some Hungarian music and I see what they're doing. There's a similarity, but they play almost in the middle of the boat mm-hmm. and it's not quite as sharp an attack. Uh, you know, I'm sure that, that people would do it, but it's just, I, I just haven't seen anybody develop it to where you close your eyes and it's the same sound, you know? Yeah. And so that that's the marcato stroke that you're describing, right? That like grabbing the string with, the, and it's like pizzicato with the bow. That's like the fundamental stroke for tango music, isn't it? Right, yeah. yeah. Basically, I mean, it, it. you know, if you're playing quarter notes, we call this the marcato and and very distinct from the habanera and, you know, the old tango rhythm, which mm-hmm. you still use, but, but the marcato is, is your bread and butter. It's like 90% of what you do. Um, and then there's what we call the syncopa, mm-hmm. um, which is a syncopated rhythm that uses the end of one a lot. And all of that has what we call the arrastre, which is you basically you drag into the note, either uh, for the space of an eighth note before it or the space of a quarter note even, Rum, you know, and rum, that sort of stuff, which you basically, the trick is like, you you start the sound, but you don't quite give it the full body, so you may even not be pressing your left hand all the way, and you may do a little slide with the left hand, and also the bow doesn't quite start the note until you give it a flick of the wrist. Okay. So, okay. so you, you, st- you, you know, you start moving the bow horizontally, and and the old players used to do it almost diagonally to the string, so you get this dirty sound. Yeah. And then at the at the real at the real attack of the note, you give it a flick. What I do is I extend my fingers and a flick of the wrist. Okay. Um, it's almost like, like almost like bouncing a basketball. Yeah. You know, you give it a flick of the wrist. You know, and so that produces the attack. So you started a little earlier, but with no sound, and that's usually what what takes people a minute to to get together because. You know, how do you start a note without starting it? You right. Know? Right. Yeah. Um, so that's why you know sometimes I notice that what we do is we don't we don't really press the left hand down until we get to that point, and also just you know this this like yeah. you know it's like you know you gotta get that kind of sound you know mm-hmm. um, so that that takes a little while to coordinate and to make it feel natural to make it feel not forced every single bar you have to you know and where to put these drags and so that's you know, obviously comes from a lot of playing and also a lot of listening. And if you're lucky, a lot of watching, you know, these days yeah. there's a lot more videos of good players than, than there were, you know, back in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. Are you getting are you getting a rehair every other week when you're doing this? I mean, I, it's amazing. Like, like you know, <laughs> yeah, rehairing is part of the trick. The guys at the at the at the shop where I go, they say, you know, the only other people who come as frequently as you are, are the guys at the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> uh, I'm right up there with these guys who play, you know, these epic Wagner. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm the uh, the other one. So yeah, I do lose a lot of hair. Um, I you know I like. You know, once in a while, I like playing like a pig also, you know, sure. and like really doing big stuff. And yeah, the moments where I lose my hair <laughs> is definitely a concern to always have, you know, sometimes when I travel, it's like, should I get a rehair before I travel? Because I know that, you know, a few weeks, I'm, I'm not going to be able to play with this bow, you know? Right, right. So you do preemptive, preemptive rehairs. <laughs> <laughs> And, and but that's what's so cool about the about the genre. I mean, just like all those 
cool percussive techniques and the drags and that sort of thing. What else? What else is in uh, Tangle Player's bag of tricks? What, uh, just technically speaking. Well, there's there's a couple a couple of things. Obviously, the one that everybody's noticed is that we hit we hit the box of the bass. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and 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 you know, we have this effect that we call the scapata, which is like a like a ricochet. Uh, of the bow and then you slap the fingerboard and then sometimes you coordinate that with hitting it in the back, you know, boom, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, and there's a bunch of those and I've made up a few myself. The, some of the glisses um, are really interesting, to, you know, because you can do some slow glisses up to a note or you can do, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. which, which is always fun to do and like really, you know, almost like a fill, you know, it's like you, you, you're really giving a lot of shape to the phrases by doing those things. So, and then, yeah, and all kinds of hitting, you know, hit, making percussive sounds, you know, either, either colenio or, or different parts of the bass, or very sharp attacks and things I do sometimes, you know, I'll grab a fifth and, and I give it a nice, I come from off the string and give it a big whack, doom, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And uh, maybe do that and, and on the offbeat, hit the back of the bass. You know, there's all kinds of fun stuff yeah. to do. And, Obviously, some of the advantages of being away from Argentina is that you get exposed to all this other stuff. So, you know, some of the European players, and you know, you really feel like you can incorporate some of this stuff into um, the, the tango. And it's not just, well, this is this, these are the half a dozen things that tango players do. It's like, no, you can invent, you know, we're in 2016. We can invent all kinds of other stuff. So I, I feel like I've been doing some of that as well. Yeah, it seems like you've done all sorts of pulling in other styles and like the Eastern European kind of influence. And that it's it's cool to see like tango fusion. I'm not sure if that's the right word for it, but like like you know, I watch I watch your videos and it's you've got the you've got the drum set and everything and it it's interesting. How does your role change when you introduce drum set? Because the traditional tango, you think everybody's creating the percussion kind of together. How how does right. bass playing change in that kind of setting? Right. Well, the first thing I do is I change the drummer's perspective. So okay. I talk to the drummer and, and let him know, look, you don't have to carry the whole thing on your, you know, snare, hi-hat, and bass drum. You know, you got to leave some space. You can comment. you got to share that space with me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be pumping a lot of quarter notes, so it's not necessary that you do that. And I show them I have this sheet of, of little rhythms and things that you can use, patterns that you can use, you know, either on a cymbal or across the drums or on a hi hat, and so you know, and and so it's a modern concept in a way because, you, like I said, you don't have to be carrying the rhythm; yeah. uh, the rhythm is just going to be there. Yeah. Um, but it's not quite just making little comments. It's not like you're on top of that making little fills and things. You do have to be part of the of the texture, and you know, frankly, the the the, the I don't want to say the only drummer because I've worked with some great drummers, but but the drummer that has come the closest is the guy who I've used in most of my recordings, who happens to be the grandson of Astor Piazzolla, Daniel Pipi Piazzolla in, in Buenos Aires. I really felt, and that's the first recording that I've made back in 2006, there's something called Buenos Aires Tango Standards, where I felt, you know, this is what I have in mind. You know, I, I did some great stuff with some great drummers when I was in New York and stuff, recording my first recordings in the 90s. And some of it is great music, but it's not what I had in mind. Yeah, right. Um, and and I feel like when I started recording in Buenos Aires, that for better or for worse, that's what I that's the sound, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, part of the way I figured that out is like, am I comfortable? Am I doing what I like to do? And if not, what is it? You know, I was working with this drummer in New York, and I told him exactly what to do, and I was not feeling it. I was not feeling it. And I listened to the tapes of what we were recording, and it's like, this guy's doing exactly what I told him what to do. And so <laughs> I had to sort of revise my own set of instructions, you know. Yeah. And it's hard when you, when, you, when, you, when you get a musician, you tell them, do this, don't do that. Now do this here, and don't do that here. Yeah. And, you know, you're teaching, teaching them how to be intuitive. Right. They can't, you know. Right. And so they're, you're tying their hands, and you're not really letting them be yeah you know so and and it's not about writing it all out i mean you can do that if you write everything out but that's not what i want either right right. so if you have you know like what happened with pp is that he has the you know obviously his grandfather's 
music he knows like the back of his hand and he hears tango all the time even though he's not a big tango fan for that much but he knows the miles davis quintet okay you know yeah. and he know you know and, yeah. and and he's heard charlie hayden you sure. know so so he's got both worlds in there and he understood um after a while i always remember how in, uh, on our first rehearsal for our first recording the first time we ever got together he was basically complaining there was there was too much freedom Oh really? Okay. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> this, is much, this is too much freedom. Everybody can do what they want. It's like no, <laughs> you know. But it was good because I dialed it to the other side. It's like no, you don't have to do these patterns. You don't have to really respect X, Y, and Z. But you have a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Because you bring it. You have to say this is what it is. You know, which is what happens in jazz. This is where the beat is. This is what the swing is. You know, you're not relying on a conductor or in a score or anything else, you know, this is where, that's what the great players do. It's like, this is the truth right here. Yeah. These are the quarter notes, you know? Yeah. And so you want to, you want to get to that point where it's like, they're playing themselves and they're like playing with authority and it's just happening and flowing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chance to hang out with uh astro piazzola what what was that experience like what was he like uh well yeah i saw him on, on a few occasions yeah. um i mean i was starstruck you know sure, right. um yeah. and he was he was you know he, he noticed that I <laughs> you know him and winking at me at one point i must have been looking at him with like this <laughs> total adoration he looked at right. me and smiled and winked he was on stage you know and then yeah. I just saw him, uh, you know, backstage a few times and at and, 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 uh, a reception after they had played in New York one time. And he had heard my story, some, you know, of my parents, I think, are friends with his lawyer or some, okay. there was some sure. like third, three, three degree separation. And he had heard about this crazy bass player who was playing tango in New York and who was a big fan and everything. So uh -huh. he, he, he said, I know your story. So I don't know that that there was anything musical or philosophical that I got out of it. It was just having having met the man, and there was a moment I understand where my name was thrown around when he was looking for a bass player, and he said um, to the producer, I, said, "I don't really know him," and I think he spared me the the challenge, you know, in a way. I know that he was rough with his musicians, and and I don't know that I would have been ready. This this was obviously. Uh, before he died, so we're talking about you know when I was still in my twenties, and and I don't know that I would have been ready. So it's a nice story, but but uh, otherwise, I think I got you know about his music. What I really got out the most, obviously, is from having played with his pianist Pablo Ziegler for five or six years. Sure, um, and and really get to know the intensity of the music and how it's played, and obviously playing with the pianist for Piazzolla was, was even better for me because I, I really, you know, the bass and the left hand of the piano go together and, and you really have, that's the rhythm section right there. Yeah. So that, that was really important for me. I hung out with his bass player a couple of times when, when they were on the road, I would take lessons from him. That was important. And I also had the opportunity when I worked with Yo-Yo Ma to play with two of his most important violinists and hear them and, and, and absorb the style. So I feel like like I really have gotten a privileged education in his music, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned just the, the piano and the bass and how they fit together. And, and the, so how, how does that work exactly? Are you, are you playing the exact same notes all the time with the left hand of the piano traditionally in a traditional tango setting? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you added the word traditionally because it's become, you know, some, and now that everybody is codifying this and teaching it, it they give it as given and it's not. And that's one of the things that I worked out with, with the pianist that I work with is that the, the, they can move their left hand out, especially when we're improvising, obviously when we're improvising, yeah, but yeah. the basic orchestration starting in, in the forties and, and to this day is to double the bass with, with the left hand on the piano. And so you're playing lines and it's being reinforced by the piano. And, you know, while you have a dry, you have a single attack and you sustain this from your left hand, they play very legato on the left hand. So that's where you get that boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You know, 
singing bass line, a uh, driving force of the orchestra. And the pianist, usually their right hand is a lot more staccato, so, so they need to be able to do that. But yes, that's the traditional orchestration. When you start improvising, obviously, you know, when we play what we call a la parisa, which is the grill, which is the, the sort of the, the simple improvised way of playing tangos without arrangements, mm. there are formulas for the bass lines. And so at least half of the time we're playing the same bass line. Sure, but right, yeah. Otherwise we're at, Otherwise, we're at cross purposes, and it's a it's a dangerous register to be playing different bass lines. You know, yeah. If you have two bass lines down there; it's muddy and it's, it kind of creates a little bit of chaos. So you have to be careful. You know, sometimes it's just looking at the left hand and 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 meeting left hand, which a lot of bass players we, we get used to doing that, just meeting the pianist's left hand and getting the chords from there and getting the lines making up lines. Like when I used to work with Ethan Iverson, we used to make a lot of bass lines up and just sort of have our, our repertoire of, of bass lines. And like I said, there's some traditional ones, the you know, descending and ascending bass lines that you just know and you just kind of trust your intuition that you're putting them in the right place. But otherwise, what I do in my band is, that's another important thing in my orchestration is to, you know, use the left hand like you use it in jazz to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, play the bass in jazz. You know, you, you play, you play sort of a middle register voicings and, and, uh, you know, once in a while you can throw a bass bomb, but other than that, just kind of stay away and let me handle that register. Yeah. And you trust, especially in a band situation when you have an amp and everything, you trust that you don't need to be doubled in order to have that, penetrating sound you know because that's that's what it is and you're in an orchestra with four bandanones or five and the whole string section and bass and piano for the bass to really carry the backbone of the orchestra you need that very clear punchy piano attack you know yeah, yeah, yeah um in the context of what i do i you know i use the amp i play a lot harder obviously um, and, and, and have sort of not just a pitch approach to bowing, but a jazz pitch approach to bowing, like, like Mingus on the, on the bow. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, uh -huh. and, and so the pianist can, can just lay off the left hand and, and play some voicings and things like that. But, but it really, it took, it took a while for me to develop that because you really have to play hard and you still want to play, you know, you don't, you don't want to play like a pig. You want to, you want to be able to play nice lines and, and have some subtlety to what you do, but but really have a strong a strong foundation for the band. Yeah. <laughs> What, it, hey, in terms of like string height and that sort of thing, if you look at like what a jazz player might typically do and what you do or what a tango player would do, do you do you have to keep your strings higher for these kind of techniques or? Yeah, well, I ha I have sort of a yeah I have a sort of a hybrid setup. I just have one bass. I remember there's there's a there's a guy in in Argentina when I when I uh, when I go there who who loans me his bass and he says you know I have the tango bass and I have the jazz bass. So that's exactly what you're asking. It's the, the, the tangle. Look, you need you need space between the fingerboard and the string for it to like really have room to to vibrate, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. in general, classical players tend to have a higher setup because of that. Uh, you know, the low string uh, that uh, that some jazz players use that allows you to be really flexible and nimble and that sort of stuff won't work because as soon as you put your bow down with a little bit of weight, it'll choke okay. the string against the fingerboard. So what I've done, and I'm not a big string geek, but but I really have found I think the string that does both things as well. Because if you have you know stiff orchestra strings and you have a high setup, when you switch to pits, it's a torture. So I've been using the Pirastro. Uh, they used to be called Wonder Tones. They're called the Jazzer. Okay. Which I find the rope core strings, and I find that I can switch back and forth sometimes they feel better on the bow than on the pits, but, it, you know, and, and I don't have one of these like Ray Drummond, you know, pitching hands, you know, right, I, right. I have, I, I, it's okay, but it's not like, you know, I haven't spent my life playing pits. I've spent my life playing mostly bow. So yeah. I don't, you know, I don't have that kind of strength. So I do need the string to cooperate with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 
you know, the setup needs to be high enough so that the string vibrates and not too high that, that you know, you just you can't play. Now, you travel all over the world, and with the bass, you know, that's always fun. Are you, are you uh, borrowing a bass these days? Are you traveling with a bass? What's that, what's that been like for you, like the last, you know, 10, 15 years? Right. Well, I'm not as much a road warrior as some of my colleagues. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't go on extended tours. I go out of town quite a bit. And around the world, indeed, but but not, you know. So, and some, you know, most of the gigs that I get are are at places where they are able to get good instruments from oh, me. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, yeah. So I I think the last time I traveled with my instrument was about ten years ago. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, I've also noticed, yeah, I've also noticed that some of the planes I get on would never have taken the trunk to begin with. Um, I mean, there's some, some flights that you get on, they, you know, there's small planes and, and it would just be, it's an enormous expense. It's, it's a pain in the butt on both sides of the trip, as everybody knows, um, the transportation and who picks you up and what kind of van they need to bring and so forth. Um, I mean, we all know these things. So I've been lucky enough and, and, you know, unless like I'm, I'm getting now to, to, um, I'm doing a, um, a program where I'm a little bit more of a soloist. Um, than I usually am, and that's opening a whole new world of worry for me because I really need to have an, a good instrument that that really responds to a number of things, and I have all these harmonics and things that I need to do in the repertoire that I'm playing, and that's getting a little scarier. And and I'll let you know in a few weeks if it's worked out or not. <laughs> okay. I have a big one coming up in a couple of weeks, and and that worries me a lot. So you know, I'll have a couple of days with the instrument, but otherwise, I mean, I remember one kind of nightmarish. The moment I, I played in, in Taiwan a couple of years ago, and it was a, a great instrument. It was a French a jacket from like 18-something or other. It belonged to, to one of the guys in the symphony. But you could put your fist between the strings and the fingerboard. <laughs> oh, no. And it was, not an, it was not an adjustable bridge. And I basically just kind of said, okay, just don't get injured. And that was my attitude towards the gig, I'm sorry to say, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. It's like, pl- play, you know, play, play in tune, play with rhythm, <laughs> and get some good sound, but just basically don't get injured. Yeah. Trying, you know? It's like I couldn't really do my thing because, but I was the bass player in the band, uh, you know, with all due respect, the bass player in the band. I was just there to do that, and I wasn't there to, you know, to play all these solos and and even improvise and stuff. So I, I just kind of, you just learn how to regulate your energy so that you're not, you know, two songs into the whole thing, your hand is cramped, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, my road warrior friends, I have been doing the, the, uh, uh, bass that you pull apart. Yeah. And I just, I, I can't wrap my head around it. I don't know how the sound post reacts to that. If it's glued on there or something, I just don't get it. I know that a lot of these guys are mostly jazz guys. So they rely on the amp and pickup. For their sound, so maybe the instrument is not as sweet as you would want it to be, anyway. And obviously, you know, the the main, the other main concern is having your own fingerboard, you know. Yeah. Because yeah. you show up and you have an E flat neck instead of a D neck, and all of a sudden you don't really know where that octave is, and then the gig starts, and you could be off by half <laughs> step. Yeah. Exactly. You know, very quickly, <laughs> you know, you go into some position and you don't know where things are, and that is more of a concern. Is that the big piece of black wood that we you know we find our notes in yeah. um getting used to the scale you know so i asked for you know three quarters uh a uh, uh, concert level a professional level instrument with a d-neck d-neck yeah. and most of the times it works out and i i and i've thought about taking my own set of strings but i i i, I just never done it i've never really had the urge to say you know i'm going to spend the next half hour changing strings on this yeah, place you know yeah. but 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 maybe for this gig that i'm doing in a couple of weeks in, in uh, san diego i may do i may just even take an old set of strings just to just in case you know yeah um sure. so it's it's a little bit of a torture you know but but it's gotten hard for everybody traveling with instruments right well that's cool so you'll be in san diego soon where where else are you headed in 2016 what do I have? I have a few things in, in New York. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm regularly on Sunday nights when I'm in town. I play at a place called Zinc Bar. We have a regular tango night there. Mm-hmm. We've been going for three years. I play with something called the Astoria Tango Orchestra, and we do, we do a every other month or so. That's a full-blown tango orchestra with, you know, four bandos and, and string sections and stuff. Um, we play big dance events. 
Um, so I've got a couple of those coming up. I'm going to be booking my new program, which is basically based in string quartet, um, most likely into a place like Cafe Valley or somewhere like that, so I can start getting some mileage in that in the fall. Cool. And yeah, a few other things, like the Asola type programs, you know, tango programs with different people as a sideman. Um, I have some work with um, the great Emilio Soria, who's a um, Argentine composer and band leader, and, and like that. This thing coming up in San Diego, I'm with Paquito de Rivera. Nice. He's got a a feature night at the La Jolla Chamber Music Festival, and he invited me, and he asked me to bring some music as well. So I have one of my pieces, and I have a little mini concerto that was written for me that I'm that I'm premiering, and um, and uh, classic tango as sort of a, as a base feature as well. So I get my little spot in that program. This is awesome. Is is there anything else you want to get out to people? That- yeah, well, I have, you know, my recordings are out there. Uh, look me up on the, on the uh, Spotify's of the world. I have a bunch of videos and some live videos on my YouTube channel, which is called Avantango Media. And if you look it up by my name, I think you pretty much come down to, to, you know, my quintet from Buenos Aires is represented there. The other thing is I'm, I'm starting to realize that I have to be teaching on Skype. Oh, okay. <laughs> that yeah. there's, you know, yeah, cause I, you know, I don't have a regular teaching practice, but I do, I do get people from all over the world literally coming to me to, you know, to figure out what it is that I'm doing with the tango and just sort of get pointers and, there's more and more bass players that are interested in that. And so I, you know, I, I would love to help and just, um, you know, be in touch with me. And, and, um, I have somebody who just offered me to, to be sort of the intermediate school, intermediary school that sets up my online teaching. So I don't have to deal with some of the logistics and technology. So I'll be teaching on Skype, hopefully in the fall. And I'm easy to get a hold of if you go to my website, my contacts there, and I, uh, you know, I try to be as friendly and, and prompt as possible, getting back to people. Thanks again, Pablo, for the great interview. And be sure to check out everything Pablo's up to on his website, pabloislan.com. Now, I sent out a survey last week in Holy cow, ask and ye shall receive. I got so many great responses back. So thank you a thousand times over if you filled out that survey. And if you haven't, go to ContrabassConversations.com forward slash survey. And I'll leave it up for a couple of weeks and then I'll pull it down for the rest of the year. And one of the questions I asked on this survey was how this podcast has helped you. And the response was overwhelming, humbling. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let me just share a couple that I think you'll enjoy. I've got many others uh, that that I'll let you know about later. So here, here are a few. I have followed your podcast for a number of years and the information I've received on so many different topics relating to the double bass is extraordinary. I'm a professional performer in a variety of genres and a teacher. Your interviews have been such a mine of information as you know how to ask the best questions in order to let your interview subjects expand on subjects in great detail. Living in Australia, you give me, many of my peers and students, incredible access to the international double bass dialogue. Many thanks. Oh, I love that. Oh, I, love, I love the way that's phrased, the international double bass dialogue. That is what I'm trying to do here. That's awesome. Thank you. Hey, here's another. You've had your blog for at least a decade now. I can't describe how helpful it was when I was in high school and living in a place with no other basis. Can't make that up. And I was on my own driving three hours for lessons bi-weekly. Your show really helped keep the excitement going when no one else could care. Oh, man, thank you so much. for Wow, that is – and, I, of course, I, I, I got all these great testimonials, and I, and I I always do this. I forgot to include a stinking – if you're leaving something, leave your name. So if I'm reading your testimonial, I, I, I actually am not sure who has left these. So I have these fantastic anonymous testimonials. Arr, I used to do that when I sent out surveys for my teaching job. I would ask all these detailed things and I would forget to include the name field. It's a, I, I need to work on that skill. But man, that is exactly the kind of person that I was hoping that this show would get to. You're you're out there. You're you're stuck in the car. You're stuck doing something, and you have these podcasts with people from all over the world. I mean, to me, that is 
what's so cool about this technology? That's so what so amazing. This podcasting, just in general, that it's it's such a great medium for that. When you're doing something, I call it a secondary activity, right? You're washing the dishes, or you're taking a shower, or you're working out, or you're doing whatever. Podcasting is so, or you're in the car. That's a big one. Podcasts are so great for that. I'm just so thrilled to hear that kind of feedback. I got one more for you. Uh, as a young student, and I still consider myself a student, I learned a great deal from Samuel Applebaum's series, The Way They Play. I consider Contrabass Conversations the next generation of such informative publications and look forward to each Contrabass Conversations podcast, knowing that I will benefit in some way from each of Jason's guests' experiences and insights. I routinely refer my students and colleagues to the podcast and consider it an invaluable asset to our community. My congratulations and appreciation for Jason Heath's dedication and efforts to explore and expand the limitless versatility and potential of our noble instrument. Wow, what eloquent phrasing. That is fantastic. And I don't know if others listening to this have checked out that Samuel Applebaum series, The Way They Play. It is great. And I wonder if that was in the back of my mind when I started this podcast. When I was at school at Northwestern in Chicago, I used to go to the music library and I would check out those books. And I would just sit there and I would read all of these interviews with famous artists. I don't remember when these books came out, but they are a fantastic series. And wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, if I just shared your testimonial, shoot me an email and let me know your name. Uh, I need to be better about leaving a name field on my next survey. And just one more thing before we wrap up here. Prague 2016 is coming up and I have booked my flight. I've got a place to stay for the week. I am there and I am pumped. Are you going to be there? If you are, I'd love to meet you. Let's hang. That would be great. I'll be there the whole week and I'm just so excited to check it out and meet everyone who's going. So if you're going or you're performing or you have a recommendation of something for me to check out there, let me know. I'm just starting to dig into the website and see what's going on. Hit me up on social media, send me an email, get in touch, let me know. And thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it and I appreciate you. And I do think this is your show. I do this for you and I couldn't do it without you. All my guests these days they come from recommendations from people who are listening. So connect with me if you haven't. Social media. Join my email list. I'd love it if you did that. I'm honored every time I see new subscribers on that list. We're in the thousands now and growing strong. And subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. If you're listening to this for the first time, ContrabassConversations.com forward slash subscribe. It'll show you how to do it in iTunes, using anything else. Or if you're not familiar with that kind of technology, just join my email list. I'll send you an email when the new episodes come out. And you know, there's so many ways you could be spending your time right now. And I, from the heart, I'm honored that you're spending it with me and with Pablo, listening and learning about this exciting world that we're living in right now. So again, check out the website, find me on social media. You can learn more about the podcast and we'll see you soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 